Perfect. Hi, um, thank you so much for coming to the final lecture in the Indigo Lecture Series headed by the Mass Art Sustainability Department and Fibers Professor Karen Hampton. Um, my name is Alyssa Nichols. I'm a student at Mass Art who's had the privilege to TA for Karen this semester. Um, I would like to introduce to you professor, artist, mother, mentor, and friend, Karen Hampton. Um, Karen Hampton is an American Craft Council Fellow and is a conceptually based fiber artist who addresses issues of colorism and kinship. Hampton is recognized as a figurative storyteller who weaves together the textures and colors of the ancient world with that of an imagined future. Material and imagery are part of the methodology that she uses to access her ancestral and personal heritage. Um, in this lecture, Professor Hampton will be discussing her own personal journey with indigo. She will discuss her usage of, of indigo through her own art, but also her historical findings and research on the cultural significance of indigo. Um, when I was talking to Karen, um, we have a weekly kind of call. I was able to kind of pick her brain a bit about, you know, her time um, doing her journey through like her indigo series, which involved her traveling um, to like Southern states and visiting plantations where this indigo was manufactured um, by enslaved people at the time. Um, and so I said that she, uh, you know, she started her journey with indigo by traveling down South to complete field work and research um, on the manufacturing of indigo by enslaved peoples on Southern plantations. Um, she visited Charleston in South, South Carolina in 1999, which was known to be one of the biggest cities to grow and manufacture indigo on plantations during the late 1740s. Uh, there she saw the aftermath of the horrific events that went into the creating the American textile industry due to the exploitations of enslaved people. Um, this journey helped educate Hampton and in turn educate others on the background of this pigment. And Hampton was able to create space for herself within the Eurocentric textile industry due to this experience she had on her journey, which I think is incredible. And I'm honored again to be selected to introduce such an incredible artist and woman like Karen Hampton. She's quite simply a remarkable person and artist and full of insight and wisdom. And I'm so happy to introduce her as the featured artist today. So thank you so much for letting me be a part of this and, you know, be a part of um, your world this semester. And I'm so excited to be here. And yeah, this, this is her talk. So I'm excited. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Alyssa. That was that was like the most beautiful introduction I think I've ever had. Thank you. Um, I am going to, let's see, let me share my screen. And now all of a sudden I can't find it. So let me just... That was really bad. No. <laughs> this is really funny. Why can't I find it? And this is funny. Okay, now I should be able to do it. Sorry about that. Never mind. 
Okay, so I've titled this talk, Making the Invisible Visible. And I think that that's like a common theme within my work for quite a length of time. Really, it's been digging into the past for me to understand it and then kind of my way of making it into artwork is a way of making it real for myself and making it something that is um, very tangible. Um, whether woven or stitched, every time my weft crosses the warp or my needle pierces the cloth, I reach through another layer of the scorched earth that slavery has left behind and attempt to reframe the issues of slavery and modern day race that divide us. So I'm really looking at how, what I can give through my investigation that can help broaden and solidify a real history of the, which we come from. And so then maybe we can go through steps to, to move on. You know, there's, um, there's an African phrase, Sankofa, and, and it means to remember your past so you don't have to repeat it. Um, I'm starting right here with, sorry about that, some images from Boone Hall, which is one of the plantations I visited in um, South Carolina. And this, my trip, as Alyssa said, was in 1999. And during that period of time, there were actually very few people that visited plantations. Boone Hall was famous because many, many movies had been filmed on the location. Um, but for average people to go and visit, it was very unusual. This was the point in time when the internet had just gained great popularity. And the thing that happened for me, which was very lucky, was it was exactly the same period as I was doing my research. And the most popular topics on the internet when it first began were plantations and genealogy. And I was in graduate school and I had a graduate, I had a research assistant who guided me through um, how to use the internet and conduct this research. So if you were to go today to Boone Hall, the slave quarters would not look in this, look like it does in this photograph. But this was at the time one of the one of the limited number of locations where you could actually see a slave quarters. And this, while it's not very tall yet, is a young indigo plant. Um, the indigo that was grown in throughout the US was um Indigo Ferra Carolina. And it's a plant that grows to about five to six feet tall and is usually grown on a center stalk. So it's very, very different than what many of us know as Japanese indigo, which is um, not even a, like a an annual shrub is what I would call it, that... Um, that only grows to a foot and a half tall. Here's another, another photo of it. Um, one of the plantations I visited was the Hampton Plantation. And that was, I wasn't going to visit there because it didn't fit my criteria when I was beginning, which was that the plantations that I visited all had some very central connection to textiles. So they were indigo as the second oldest field crop. 
or the second largest field crop. And it was cotton becoming king and plantation weaving. And I didn't have any direct connections to the Hampton plantation, but when I visited the Pinckney plantation, the um, the rangers there told me you have to go over to the Hampton plantation because Eliza Lucas Pinckney, who many people know as the mother of American indigo, um, this was her daughter's plantation. And she lived there towards the end of her life. And so she was still growing plant, growing indigo. There's indigo that grows right on the outside of the plantation, on the plantation grounds. And I, the time that I was there, I spent a lot of time talking to the docent. It's a, because it's run by the National Park Service, it's really an architectural model. So what they do is they show you around and they talk about the architecture, the Georgian architecture. But when some other visitors came, she, um, the docent said, well, you can go upstairs. And I had been in the kitchen, which is now the bookstore, and they had lots of books that were the ghosts of, of Hampton. And I was like, you know, this is kind of an odd place to be. But I went upstairs, and as I walked upstairs, the first thing that happened to me was I started hearing things. Because they don't give any tours upstairs. They don't go upstairs. And I just flew down the stairs and my exit was blocked by the ranger who I had no idea that he was there. And he just, he physically blocked me from being able to leave. And he pulled out photographs of the plantation that were, it was the very first site where they used heat sensitive photography to to look at the land and to begin for archeological purposes of being able to study the land to see where, where dwellings were. In particular, they were looking for slave dwellings because there was nothing left on the ground. And this went on, this really informed a lot of my work. Part of it is because my great grandfather was from South Carolina, and um, and while I didn't know him, I never knew him. And, but um, his daughter was to tell me just how much he, you know, loved rice. Rice was the thing that she remembered most about her father. And in looking at, um, you know, they, they had over 800 enslaved people on Hampton. Mm -hmm. So my lineage could very well go back to the Hampton plantation. Um, I was interested as I was visiting different plantations in I was interested in anything that they were showing me that could connect the home, the, the cloth, the fabric, the making, the spinning, the weaving, um, and the dyeing. When I visited Somerset Place in North Carolina, this photograph that I chose is one of they you can tell they were just beginning their their archaeological dig on this plantation. This was the slave hospital, the footprint for the slave hospital. One of the experiences I had as I was doing these travels was that, and it really happened at Boone Hall, when I went and I walked into the field areas the areas where it had been fields, cotton fields, um, I could feel 
the presence. I could see, I could see shapes. I could see what looked like people out there picking cotton. I really, with all of this work, was really looking at women and imagery of women. It meant that I read um, many, many, many slave narratives. It was before they were they were digitized, and I would sit and go through library um, stacks in order to find to look at the books and to find any reference to weaving or textiles. Um, this piece, Female Negro, was one of those, the first pieces that I made, that I wove when I was doing this work. I was really thinking about invisibility, the erasure from history. And so in making this piece, I wanted it to feel like erasure. Another piece, Spirits Cry, which went back to that, that experience I had at Boone Hall, where I really thought about the children. Um, this is a piece that was that was later, a few years later. This was when my work was extending into Florida and into my own family's lineage in Florida. And really, when in doing this research, where I was um, looking at my family, which was a very, very different kind of structure that had not been um, never included in history, really, um, as I was really looking at my family that became a mixed race family in the late 1700s, um, I was realizing that my research in North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia very much tied to my Florida research in the fact that the people that were persecuting my family and the culture in, in Florida were the same people, the same planters that I'd been studying and visiting their plantations and going through their archives. Um, but they were the same people, which which was like kind of like a fatal moment where you kind of feel like, oh, this is really interesting. I'm I how one thing led me to another almost on purpose. Um one of the installations of some of my work from that period, um, really my work, I, I feel very fond of text and the stitch in terms of bringing out text and really thinking about, um, thinking about the, the human imprint on cloth. And so really working on making my work have the feel of an aged cloth. And in the indigo piece that you can see on the left, which is the backside of it, um, what I'm doing is making a bed cover. And it was to symbolize a bed cover of a woman that's being taken at night and the and her basically her rape is being in is burning through the claw um this was the piece that i created after visiting hampton um and it was really i felt like my role with that was really that I was the observer and I was putting these women back 
into the landscape because the the guiding force that led me to do this research was really really stemmed from the fact that I could not find anything that was documenting um, the lives of African-American women in textiles. And I was looking for a route for myself and my own work. And so this was how, how I found it. Um, these are two pieces. They're um, different periods. The one on the left is much later than the one on the right. The one on the right was another piece from after visiting Hampton. And it was after seeing the photographs and really the thinking about the slave quarters and then you know, those areas, because there's no remnants of all of those people, over 800 people, there's nothing left. Um, I was able to get, at that point, um, a printout of the names of the enslaved, but no other record there. And so what I was trying to do was to create really to really create those those hot spots and that their presence really was felt on the land it was the biggest lesson i learned in that travel which was that the landscape talked and it's forever led me to do research because i found that by going to these places and walking walking in these historical settings, especially if they have not been touched too much, um, that, that there really are the remnants of the past society. Our, the, the human mark is there. You can see a couple of the um, the stitched pieces a little closer here. Um, later in doing work on Florida and really my family lineage was quite surprising to me because you know that when you go in Florida, the culture was very, very different under under the Spanish, which Florida held control of until eight, well, the Spanish were in control of Florida um, during the second period until 1821. There was an earlier period, Spain held it until approximately 1764 and then for 20 years, it was British, and then it became Spanish again until 1821. And, you know, and there was this period of time where, um, where mixed race community, a mixed race community um, really flourished. And so it was, that became a fascination of mine for a long time. Um, one of the things that you don't see much of anymore are bottle trees, but the, you know, a bottle tree was a place of, was symbolizing safety, was symbolizing a, a place of cultural, um security within many african american communities it was a, it was part of the spirituality this was a piece that i did the later piece 
but really it reflects very much back on the on indigo and on the fact that this is Florida and this is Fort Mose. Fort Mose was um, the first free black community within the United States. Um, dating back to the 1700s, that if enslaved people escaped from, from South Carolina and they made it to they made it to Florida to the Spanish, if they agreed to take up arms against the British, they and Americans, they were given a piece of land. And this is all that stands on of Fort Mose anymore, but it's the only place where it, they're along the coast where there is a bank of trees. And it's a very, very interesting, incredible place. And I felt so lucky. I still feel so lucky to get to work with the archaeologists and anthropologists and historians there. Um, one of my stitched pieces in this piece really was about um, it came after I visited, well, when I, when I conducted these travels, I carried three books with me. I carried Eliza Lucas Pinckney's letters book, letter book, letters book, and I carried, oh, I carried a book titled Sally Hemings. Um, and it, this was the period of time when the whole, when Sally, when the whole Thomas Jefferson, Sally Hemings story was just coming to light. And the Thomas Jefferson's acknowledged family was in absolute denial to Sally Hemings children being Thomas Jefferson's children. And when I visited Monticello, one of the things that fascinated me the most in this period, because I was reading this book that was written in the 60s by Barbara Chase Rabot. And as I'm reading that book, she had from the, that they had changed the tour from the 60s to the period when I was there. They had, they had actually gone in and architecturally remodeled parts of the house. So you didn't see connections that she had access to when she had visited in the 60s. I was so fascinated. And then I was to realize because they, they're, Docents are incredibly scholarly. Most of them have PhDs and they they are in charge of, they write their own script. And so I was like, oh, this is so interesting how the story is told. And that I found that the docent that I had within the house, he he totally, you know, said, he was totally did not buy Sally Hemings story or anything. But it, as soon as I got out to Mulberry Row, which is the area where the black craftsmen worked um, or craftspeople worked, I was to find that they had a, they wrote a completely different script. And so again, another chance to see how a racial divide can happen. I put this one in, this slide in, these were my ancestors eight generations ago. On the right is my 
piece to my ancestor, Flora, Flora Leslie, and on the right, on the left, um, George John Frederick Clark. And this, the fascination to me, I was really, when I met George, and I describe it as meeting both George and Flora, when I met George, I was so happy to meet a white ancestor who I liked, someone that I was proud of, someone that, you know, that spent, he was a, you know, a, a true, he was a soldier, he was an intellect, he was lieutenant governor, he was um, surveyor general of Florida. And without going into details, when George died in 1836, he left 33,000 acres to his brown children. And what I was to see when I look at my father seven years following him, and I had always been so curious about, about my father's family. And really what I was to find was just everything about, about how the the thing that they had was they had a sense of self and pride. His granddaughter, who lived into the 1890s, she was interviewed in a newspaper. And when she was interviewed, they're talking about her because she was one of the last people um, to still be alive from the Fran Spanish land grants. And they described her as having this picture of her, her grandfather on her, um, on her nightstand. And, you know, I just really, you know, really that, that that is the thing that is robbed of people more than almost anything else. It's a sense of belonging, a sense of pride, a place to grow from. I included this. This was a piece I did for George. Um, he described his life as living in the theater of St. Augustine. Um, but when he, when he wanted to die and he wanted to be buried under a shade tree. So I was giving him a shade tree and his grave has never been found. Along my journey, one of the things, one of the places that I felt so excited to visit was I visited the museum at Hampton University. And Hampton, this was a postcard that I picked up there, but you know, you're you're looking at turn of the century young black women learning how to make, how to make, how to work with textiles. The other thing that I was so surprised that I didn't know about was that I believe Hampton was the first school to offer education to Native American students. I wanted to throw these two in. These were pieces that I created that were, um, they're, they're repurposed pieces and they're pieces that I repurpose from, in this case, 
many years ago, a student gave me tea towels, a set of tea towels, and she told me that her mother had made them, but she couldn't she couldn't live with them because of what they stood for. And they were Piccaninny tea towels. There were the seven days of the week. And so on the left is Wednesday. And so, you know, I, I accepted these and I sat on them for I sat on them for a long time before I did anything with them. Um, but then I, I thought about the one on the left. It was the first one I worked with. And I said, okay, so let me think about it. I think that, I think that her mother made these in around the 1920s was my guess. And so I thought about how can I neutralize this? you know, and change history by changing the energy of it. And so it was, so I decided two things, that I'd use a poem that I grew up with, that my mother, my mother was really insistent on um, giving us, giving my sister and I something of culture so that we would know something about from where we came. And this is a County Cullen poem, and it was written in the 20s. And it's, once riding in old Baltimore, heart filled, head filled with glee, I saw a Baltimorean looking straight at me. Now I was eight and very small, and he was no whit bigger. So I smiled, but he poked out his tongue and called me nigger. I saw the whole of Baltimore from May until December. Of all the things that happened there, that's all that I remember. And to me, those are the words of the hurt that are, that are, how society represses people. And what I chose was I decided that my since my father, I needed things that were part of the 20s. My father was born in 1928. I decided to take the silhouette of him as a child um, and put that as the overlay over the text and the original image. And the one on the right, which is an indigo piece that is a whole thing about you know, falling in love with your darkness. It's about a girl falling in love with her darkness. And it's about joy. And I think this might be the end. Um, this is a piece the long piece is titled America Now and Then, and it's a piece that I did or I finished last year. And it really addresses the road to liberation. Oh, I guess I have one more piece. And this book, this piece is titled Returning. Okay, with that, I'm going to stop sharing and join back.
Hi, Karen. I got moved out of the office, so I'm going to keep my camera off, but I'm <laughs> still here. So I just wanted to let you know I'm still here. <laughs> well, I'm open to any questions anyone has. Barbara. I have a couple of questions. Huh? Well, first was a First is a comment. You ended your talk with, I'll stop sharing. And I plead with you, never stop sharing, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> um, you have so much to share. And your words are so beautiful and so thoughtful. And your pacing allows us to sink into what you're saying. Thank you. Yeah. Then I have a question, two questions. First of all, one of the buildings you showed in the beginning, and I, it's my ignorance, but I have never seen a brick slave quarter building. And so that struck me as unusual. Maybe it was because they had more bricks than they needed in that place. But all the others that I've seen have been wood and falling down. They're really different in many, many different locations. Um, in because they're not in, they, they, you know, I think that it's because there just is a lot of brick in and around South Carolina. And so yeah. that that's that makes that sense. Was really, really it. I was to find the, the one that surprised me the most was a two story slave dwelling. You know, I found, I found one plantation in North Carolina with that. And that fascinated me. Um, there, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's well, the per the permanence of it moved me. That it didn't have to be excavated from the ground and reconstructed as if. Um, and I and I went to those same workshops. Um, how did you describe them? The the row of workshops where the handiwork was done with the craftsmen. Oh, right. Yeah, I, I saw those as well, and they were lovelyed up when I was there, which was maybe 10, 12 years ago at the most. Mm -hmm. um, and that was interesting too. Um, I felt like it was a, a, a movie set by that time, a little bit you know, prissy dub. Um, I wanted to ask you what happened on those, on those tea towels. Mm -hmm. What happened to the original image? Did, did you, did it bleach out by itself? Did you no, it's cover still it? There. It's still there. I'll go back. All I saw was the, the text and that beautiful embroidered image oh, of, no. of your me, father. Let me go and show you again. No, I can't okay. find it. Okay, let's see. That's a that's a great slide. Right there. There it is. Okay, so look down in this corner. Uh-huh. Look at the cross stitch. Oh, that's it. It's okay. the cross stitch. It's these pieces that have. <laughs> and right here, this is the cross stitch. Oh, I see. And that those were the 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 pick and any images. Yeah. Yeah, okay. this one is one child cutting the other, you know, the child's running and the other one's cutting their hair behind them. Uh-huh, yeah, okay. Well, thank you for pointing that out. I, I wondered whether they had disappeared through age or through some practice no, of yours. They were, you know, there. they were real flower sack tea towels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. and it, I to me, it was just like, this is so symbolic of what people would do in their homes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, I have no other questions except gratitude and, and kudos and, and never stop sharing. Thank you. Alyssa, did you have any questions? I you did. Um, so my question was, I kind of want, could you go back to that slide with the tea towel? Sure. So I think I've seen the piece on the right of yours before, and I'm just, I just think it's so lovely. Um, I just had a few questions for you um, in regards to, because you said, was that in, there was indigo? 
right. um what was the like the yellow and the red dyes so, oh I can't remember what the dyes were but I can tell you my method <laughs> yes please I would love to that, that I applied dye to it and then I took wax and I covered up the dye so like I was doing a batik and then I put it in the indigo. That's I just, stunning. I just kept trying to think, how could I do, you know, solve this problem that I, you know, get this mm -hmm. effect that I wanted. And then you, did you paint on the other colors? As yeah, did? I painted them on. So yeah. that's what they, they call penciling. Yeah. And usually it's indigo that's added afterwards and it's called penciling. And I might just add that it's called penciling because the French word for brush is pinceau. And as my friend, Michelle Garcia often gives lectures and says, now everybody get, please get a pinceau and, and <laughs> everybody's looking for pencils. So it's a, 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 a linguistic problem there, but penciling was the 18th and 19th century. Oh. Technique well, I had, I had no idea that, than anyone ever played that way. I just was like, how can I solve this problem? <laughs> and beautifully done. Yeah, I also um, wanted to comment as well, like, you know, that we were talking about the slave quarters in Boone Hall, and I thought that was like an interesting thing for Barbara to, you know, kind of share, because I, I didn't mention this earlier, but I'm from Charleston, South Carolina. So like, being that um you know I'm from there I've seen a lot of these places it was part of like growing up it was normalized for me to go visit these places um and I don't think I've seen like Boone Hall and that great of like a condition like that the slave quarters in that great of a condition um via since that picture that you showed but it's still standing like it's still the bricks are still there it's I mean it's not you know like it was 20 years ago, but it's still a structured building, um, still recognizable. And I, I think that's really interesting because most other plantations in South Carolina, that's not the case, or they, you know, did reconstruction on them to make them more permanent. Um, so I think like, that's also really beautiful. Um, and also I wanted to like mention that like the normalization of like visiting plantations and families taking photos, you know, and like, almost as though it's like, I wanna say a park or, you know, not a historical place that, you know, a lot of people get the background about like the dark history behind and it's still not, you know, talked about, um, which I think is crazy now it being like 2023. So I just wanted to thank you so much for, you know, giving me so much insight and uh, education towards this topic because I think you know my education was very skewed growing up in, in an area like that so it's it's really nice to know the actual history behind um and the culture cultural significance behind um indigo itself and the people who created it so I just wanted to to thank you on that as well sorry if that was like a ramble but oh, no. <laughs> No, I really appreciate it. Um, I think that, you know, I think that, you know, the things that I, that I like to show are the connections. And I didn't really go into it here, but, you know, when I think about, you know, the, really, the need for blue in Europe, and Wode was not was not able to give them what they wanted, enough of it. And so it became India's job. And then from India, it went to the Caribbean. And so you have really, you know, this is where history, I think, plays such an important role that where you have history um, in like Eliza Lucas Pinckney's father, being the governor of Montserrat and indigo was the primary crop in Montserrat. So the process of then really 
really, you know, he wants to go make his fortune even bigger and bigger. I'm sure he's just like, you know, full of it. And, and so it's the expansion, the great expansion into the South and then the great expansion also, you know, as we watch cotton, which when indigo first is, is being, you know, is rice is the largest field crop and the second largest field crop is indigo. And then what happens is that in 1790, in 1793 is when, is when the cotton gin is patented. And so within 10 years, it grows a hundredfold. Slavery grows a hundredfold. And you go from having the, you know, these colonial plantations to having just a flood of plantations. So um, I think that I think it's so important to understand that because because then we can actually you can follow the money trail because that's what it is that's what you know it's it's all about economics. Yeah, I remember you you saying that to me um, when I was kind of like picking your brain that it was essentially all based on economics and the fact that like that was somewhat mind-blowing to me it was crazy because you're so totally right about that um and it's just like crazy how I don't know that that you know that worked with all of that I think like I just think it's crazy how much money was uh made off like the backs of these people that got no recognition for it you know and how a color blue is so significant, how one singular color, that pigment is so significant, um, especially in this time, in this time, and how like we can like almost what you're doing with your art is kind of remembering, but also like showcasing that. And I think that's also very beautiful. Um, I also love learning about your ancestors. That was amazing. <laughs> I had no idea that that was your ancestry. I think that's incredible that you were able to like dig that deep and find all of that. It's amazing. Well, the latest stuff is, you know, the Mormons are really amazing people. <laughs> they're you're the, right. They do they're make some really cool being, <laughs> you know, so I send people, you know, like I do a lot of work on ancestry and I have lots of, you know, lots of relatives that do a lot of ancestry work but you know I start I've always had an account with the Mormons which is called family search because I like I do not feel like I have anything in common with the Mormons except for the fact that they're all trying to get to heaven and so in them trying to get to heaven they have to help everyone get their ancestry right um uh but I mean, I was just recently able to find my lineage through Flora Leslie, who I introduced you to, you know, George and Flora. Um, through Flora, we have our ancestry dating back through her white slave-owning father, dating back to the 18, 800s, not 1800s, 800s. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. I feel, like, I feel like I've listened to another episode of Finding Your Roots with Dr. Gates, which I am addicted to, I must admit. It's an excellent program. This is great. No, I think that's fantastic that you were able to make that connection. Also, like, making that a part of your pieces, that was also mind-blowing. I had, like, an oh, my gosh moment. I was like, this is amazing. Um <laughs> Are well, those people bring them to life? I mean, yeah. they, you know, they have like I didn't have any clue. You have to understand that I didn't have when I began the work, when I was doing the work in graduate school, and I finished in um let's see, I finished in 2000. Six months later, I really did not know that I had any heritage in Florida. 
And it was only my father giving me a call and telling me, you know, that he had been contacted by by a cousin that he hadn't spoken to in 40 years that was that had all of these documents who was you know who in his retirement had become head of a genealogical society and it was like oh my god this is exactly the same period i'm studying that i've been like digging so hard into you know it's just and it's not far away florida the south carolina is not far no, it's 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 actually not that far at all. Um, I didn't really think about, you know, the impact Florida had also, um, until you like brought it up in the slides. Um, but that's just I just think that's that's just really beautiful. And I know my mom's been like obsessed with ancestry and trying to go to old like grave sites and finding relatives, um, which has been really interesting to to see that and uh, know more about yourself. And I think that kind of just cultivates your art even more with that as well. And I'm just enamored, essentially, you know, like this, I love just the slideshow. I love learning more about your art and this gives me really good insight into you as an artist in person. And yeah, thank, thank you so you. much again. Yeah, I, I just, I think I just want to, probably my last note is that in 1980 I spent I spent four and a half months basically hitchhiking and camping through mainly through England and I had never thought about history before in any in any um, European way it was always so boring <laughs> and I went there and it, the thing that that trip left me with more than anything else was really oh my god look at the layers of history that are all around you and it made me realize just how young this country is and I and that you know you know, 20 years later, that was what I was, this is the work that started coming because of those seeds being planted. I have like one more question for you. Sure. Um, for with most of your work, even without Indigo, is that reflective of, you know, your love of history and kind of showcasing that? Or is it just kind of with this Indigo collection that you've been like creating over years? Is that the case? No, I mean, you know, it's like blue is not my favorite color. <laughs> um, uh, it just, there are certain things where indigo feels like it's just right. And yeah. so it's a very useful tool. And I look at everything as a tool, like what will convey whatever I want to convey the best. And so, you know, it can be, it can totally be other things. You know, I, I have such a strong love for natural dyes. And I really have to tell you that more than anything else, the thing that's kept me from working with dyes as much as I would normally work with um, is the fact that having the right setup, having the right studio set up to work with dyes, without that, I don't feel like doing it. And indigo very easily can just be done outside. <laughs> and I mean, for, yeah, after taking Janine's class, I totally agree with you. It's crazy how much preparation goes into natural dye making. Um, and also like, with taking your class, I was able to revive an indigo bat the other day for my classmates. So thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> good job. <laughs> okay. 
if those are the all the questions, then I think it's time to to end the video. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. Well, thank you so much again for letting me um, be a part of this lecture series. And um, I was so excited for your talk today and it was fantastic. And thank you, just thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for including me as one of your lecturers and thank you for your friendship, so precious. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Let's see how I'm gonna stop.